So as I'm sure you're all aware and all celebrated appropriately, yesterday was Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. Get it? Some people say today is, is Revenge of the 5th. <laughs> yesterday was Star Wars Day, and I did a wedding yesterday that was appropriately Star Wars themed. The couple both had Star Wars shoes on that were awesome, and I've got to find me a pair of them. Um, the groom had Star Wars suspenders. The groomsmen and myself all had Star Wars bow ties. But the best part is, I got to do the wedding dressed as a Jedi. I had on full Jedi regalia. It was awesome. Seeing as we just had the, uh, the end of the original arc of the original um, Avengers team in the movies... It's time to turn our focus to December, where we'll have the end of the Star Wars saga, at least for now. I mean, Star Wars is such a moneymaker, there will be more Star Wars movies. I have zero doubt. And there will be new endings to look forward to. You know, the, uh, the, the, the wedding was Star Wars themed. There were, all the centerpieces were Star Wars um, put into Star Wars glasses. There were the Star Wars figures everywhere. Um, I was not the only one in costume. There were other guests that were wearing Star Wars costumes. The, uh, the little girl who did uh, Bubbles before the bride, she had on a Darth Vader tutu. It was amazing. <laughs> but being the nerds that we are, there was more than just Star Wars represented at this wedding. And of course, the groom's ring was the one ring from the Lord of the Rings. And if you want to talk multiple endings, look at the end of Lord of the Rings. Every time you think it's over, there's another ending. Not just in the movies, which do this as well. The, the Return of the King movie has about 12 endings. But the books, too, every time you're like, okay, I think that's it. And then you turn the page and it's like, oh no, the Shire's on fire now. I mean, it's not like I'm complaining. I will take all the Lord of the Rings that J.R.R. Tolkien wanted to give me. But it was almost like he couldn't end the story. It's interesting because there are some people that believe that John 21 is actually a later addition to the Gospel of John. Whether by the author or by someone else, we don't know. We don't even know for sure that it's a later edition, but there is a lot of textual evidence to back that up. In fact, if we looked at just right before our verse that we had today, if we looked at the very end of John 20, verses 31 and, 30 and 31, it reads, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that through believing, you may have life in his name. That feels like an ending. And it wrapped up everything John really wanted to do. Chapter 20 starts with Mary Magdalene at the tomb. And it ends after the, Jesus has shown himself to the disciples minus Thomas. And then shown himself to the disciples with Thomas. So that Thomas can feel the wounds to see it's really him. And it has this beautiful thing of blessed are those who believe but have not seen. All these things are written so that you may believe and that through believing you may have life in his name. I mean, that's an ending. That's an ending. And yet, here we get another ending. Then, <laughs> Jesus shows up again. And when, when John has this beautiful, poignant moment of blessed are those who believe and have not seen, he kind of seems, if he wrote this ending, to kind of go against that a little bit by having them understand and believe in Jesus because of the act of the miracle that he gives them. They believe because they see. They don't even recognize it's him until they're like, we didn't have any fish. Now we've got 153 fish. It's Jesus. 
Diana Butler Bass spoke on Twitter about why she believes a new ending was added. She believes it was added probably around 10 years later. And she talks about that Christians had thought that Jesus was going to return quickly, within a generation or so of his death, resurrection, ascension. But he didn't. And not only did he not return in the timely manner expected, things were getting worse for his followers. They were fighting with the other Jews on one hand who were confused as to what this movement of Jews were doing and inviting Gentiles in. And then they have the Romans who are fighting against all the Jews on the other side, the Christians and the Jews. The Romans who had gone into Jerusalem destroyed the temple. So hope for resurrection was disappearing in the face of war and death. And Diana Butler Butler Bass notes that as we read more second century writings in the Christian faith, she says you can actually feel the despair. And she sees that in this. So she places it later than the rest of the Gospel of John. Also alluding to Peter's death the way it does, probably places it a little bit later. That feeling of despair is here in John 21. Disciples are unsure of what to do with themselves after this resurrection miracle. So they return to what they know. They go fishing. But the world has changed to such an extent, they're not good at it anymore. They catch nothing. They fish all night and have no luck. The story gives us a scene of complete despair. It's cold. It's dark. There's no fish. They're not even wearing clothes. (laughs) But then Jesus appears with the break of the dawn. And he tells them to put their net to the right side of the boat. And then they catch an abundance of fish. Now, it's easy for those of us now who have four different Gospels telling multiple stories to say, oh, they recognize it's Jesus because Jesus is doing something he's done before. He's telling them to put the net on the other side of the boat. We remember that happened way early in his ministry. Well, yeah, in Luke, not in John. So John's not trying to get us to see that connection, to say that, oh, they recognize this Jesus because Jesus is doing something that he's done before. He's telling them, put your net on the other side of the boat like he did before, and that's how they recognize it's Jesus. No, because that happened in Luke, not in John. So that's not what John is trying to get us at. But what John is saying is that they recognize it's Jesus because there was lack, and now there is abundance. And that's the whole point of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' appearance is a reminder that what Jesus is doing is about abundance and provision. While Rome is selling scarcity and fear, and the disciples and the Christians, 40, 50 years after Jesus' death, or maybe even more when this is written, They're living in scarcity and fear, and the author wants to remind themselves that's not what what we're doing is about. It's about abundance and provision. So they recognize it's Jesus because where there was lack, now there is abundance. In the darkness of a time when fear and questioning had become the norm, this further ending reminds the readers and hearers what Jesus' ministry was about. While the empire seems to have won, while the feel of death is strong, while those who follow Jesus might wonder what resurrection could even possibly mean, what good it even did, there's a feast on the beach. A feast with the one that the empire had killed. A feast of large fishes, more fishes than you can even imagine, more than should be possible. It should break the net, it's so many. But nothing is impossible for God. 
And that's what Jesus came to show, came to bring about. But this isn't the end either. Jesus takes the message out of the symbol of the breakfast of abundance in words and asks Peter, do you love me? He asks it three times enough to where Peter gets annoyed and hurt. And after answering in the affirmative, Jesus tells him, take care of the flock, feed the flock, feed my sheep. The abundance is for everyone. Diana Butler Bass writes that sit and eat is what Christians say in the face of death and despair. Sit and eat. Partake of God's endless abundance. The table has seats for those that have gone before, those that are sitting on the beach even now, and all those that have yet to even be born. Come and feast. Love and cherish one another. Make sure all are fed. It was a message that needed to be heard. It's a message we still need to hear. We claim to be an Easter people. We claim to be a people that claim death is not the end. Yet how often do we find ourselves in despair, void of hope, wondering what possible good we can find moving forward as we deal with further mass shootings? A week can't go by where we don't hear about mass shootings. University in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, this last week. As we look and recognize and see that the time we have to respond to the devastation to our environment is rapidly, if not already, gone. as we become more and more divided politically and seem to lose any chance of making change that can actually benefit people because too many are caught up with winning. All of our politicians care more about enriching themselves than doing good for the people. And then I admit that yesterday in the joy of a wedding, I was also caught up in despair. Because we lost Rachel Held Evans yesterday, one of the greatest Christian thinkers, speakers, writers of our time. She was 37. She has two young children, and she died way too young. I joined many in mourning her, and Christianity is not as strong today as it was when she was still among us. Because her voice was an important voice, especially for those who had come out of evangelism and thought there was no place for them in Christianity. And yet Rachel was able to find a way to bring a lot of those people back into progressive Christianity. She's a voice whose absence I think we're going to realize we're going to miss for a long time. But thankfully, thankfully, we still have the words that she wrote. One paragraph she wrote speaks loudly to me this morning. She wrote, our God is in the business of bringing dead things back to life. So if we want in on God's business, we better prepare to follow God to all the rock bottom, scorched earth, dead on arrival corners of this world, including those in our own hearts, because that's where God works. That's where God gardens. There's no ladder to holiness to climb, no self-improvement plan to follow. It's just death and resurrection over and over again, day after day, as God reaches down into our deepest graves And with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, rests us from our pride, our apathy, our fear, our prejudice, our anger, our hurt, and our despair.
Hers is a voice that we will miss, but it's a voice that through her words is thankfully still with, with us, a voice that we still need. Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep, follow me. This is still not the end. Even when it is filled with death and hope seems lost, that's where God gets the most work done. And it's the work that God asks us to join in on. Feed my sheep. Follow me. It's still not the end. There is more death to come. But death is always followed by resurrection. The abundant gifts of God are waiting for us to share in a breakfast on the beach. And all we have to do to join in that feast is continue the work that God has been doing all along. Feed my sheep, follow me, amen.